I would like to welcome everyone to today's live stream, Navigating Job Market Uncertainty Stuck or Safe. I'm Demetrius Malbro, founder of Data Protection Gumbo, and I am thrilled to be your host and also facilitator for this timely discussion. And as we all know, the job market is experiencing some significant shifts right now, and many of us are feeling the impact of a tightening job market also rising recession fears and the tough decisions that come with it. And we're all wondering right now whether or not the job market would get, would get better. That's why we're here. We're here to answer some of the, the big questions that we're going to tackle here. And so we've got a fantastic lineup for you today with two expert guest speakers who bring a wealth of knowledge and experience to the table. And uh, together, we're going to dive into the challenges facing workers today, especially tech workers, and also share some insights on how to navigate this complex landscape and answer some of your burning questions. And so first up, I'd like to introduce our first guest speaker, Trina Hill, who is the 2023 Woman, in, Woman to Watch Award winner, mm -hmm. technology executive, certified master professional coach. TEDx speaker, author, and board member. So Trina, thank you for being on. Thank you for having me. I'm excited for the discussion. I'm honored that you would have me as my peer here today on a Friday afternoon. I think this is going to be a great discussion. I'm looking forward to it. Awesome, Trina. And I also have excited to share also and welcome the second guest speaker whose name is Ryan McClure. He is the Senior Director of People at Cloud for Good, and also an HR leader and SHRM senior certified professional as well. So Ryan, thank you for being here also. Thanks for having me, Demetrius. Excited to be here. All right. So we've got a lot to cover today. I'll be facilitating the discussion and asking our guest speakers some key questions about the job market, also the challenges workers are facing, and what actions that you can take to navigate through this uncertainty. This is also an interactive session, so I encourage you to share your thoughts in the chat window, ask questions, and also engage with us throughout the live stream. So we do want to, to hear from you and make this an interactive se session. So let's dive right in. I'd like to start off with you, Trina. What are the key indicators that the job market is slowing down and also how should job seekers interpret these signals when planning their next career move? Demetrius, I think the key is that we have to realize that we are in an election year, right? right. And if you really pay attention to really everything we do, everything is a cycle. Anytime there's an election year, most companies, especially large companies, will pull back dollars as it relates to innovation because they're not quite sure who is going to be in office. There is one party that right, is going to be more focused on the taxes, and then they're going to be another party that may not be focused on that. They may be focused on regula regula regulations and regulatory changes that, that, are, that are going to happen. And so mm -hmm. one of the things that we just need to understand, every single time there is a presidential election, large companies will sit on cash. And I'm going to tell you how you know that. You have to go back and read their financial reporting. So when you're looking at these large corporations, even in the tech space, we still have to be business people. We have to go back and look at their regulatory reporting. Anytime they do their quarterly reporting, go in and look at those statements. Because those statements will tell you how much cash they have on hand. It will also tell you what are the key things that they're focused on as an organization. And so with that mindset, a lot of companies are going to hold cash until they figure out who's going to be in office. And depending mm -hmm. on what happens with that, they will start to loosen that cash up. If I go back to the, the financial reporting, if you pay attention to where companies are, are looking at their three to five year strategies or their vision, that's the areas that you need to be in. So let's remember years ago, right, when cloud was the big thing. Yeah. If you go back and look at these large companies, and it doesn't have to be a financial company, it doesn't have to be Google or Microsoft, you can go back and look at any of the industry's companies and start looking at their financial reporting. A lot of them start talking about cloud. They start talking about 
innovation in the infrastructure. They talked about outsourcing a lot of those things. And so there are clues, but you got to read them. And a lot of times with us in text, oftentimes we may not focus on that, but you need to take the time to look at the financial reporting, see where the organizations are going, and then look at your skill set and then tailor your skill set to where they're going, not where they are today, but where they're going, because you're going to want to make sure that you create a path for yourself to grow as the organization changes. And the pivots are not going to happen overnight. For the most part, if they have a three to five year uh, strategic plan, it's not going to change overnight unless there's something huge that happens. And if it happens to them, it's probably happened to, a, to, to an entire industry. So that would be my insight there. But just remember, okay. this is a cycle. This isn't new. This happens about every four years. And Ryan, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think that was that was really well said, Trina, and definitely a way to kind of do a a deep dive into into the numbers and, and know what to look for. It's always good to keep your your eye on what's going on around at the dinner table or with your friends as well. Listen to the world around you. What's on your feed uh, and LinkedIn? Um, obviously, you want to be careful with those algorithms, but uh, you can get signs of like when you're seeing people getting laid off, when you're when you're seeing a lot of I'm starting a new job on LinkedIn. Like mm-hmm. those are like some of the pre-indicators that I start seeing. And also, I, obviously, I look at the data that comes out through the government on unemployment rates and things like that. But it's it's like anything else, like timing the market, right? Like if you could predict the future, we would all be millionaires, uh, but we're we're unable to do so. And I can tell you there's indicators and, and yes, do for sure, train 100% that election years can, you know, have disruptions in the marketplace. But just like look at COVID and what happened to the world then and, and how hiring bounced like a like a bouncing ball it went up and down, up and down and, and the world does cycle. But mm-hmm. I think being having a more solid plan and trying to eliminate some of the noise Instead, Mm -hmm. what are your personal goals? What are you looking to do? If you focus too hard on what's going on in the world around me, instead of focusing on, you know, your opportunity and how you're, how you're giving it your all to get a new job or to get a, a job after being, you know, part of an unfortunate layoff, there are going to be positions out there. It's just like, what are you doing to give yourself the best advantage to maybe grab one? So I agree that there are times that are better and easier for sure. Candidate market, employee market, those things are, are always going to shift. What what can be controlled and, and that are your controllables and that's how you're approaching everything. Yeah, I, I love both perspectives here. And what I'm hearing just in my my small little circle here is that it, it's, it's really challenging right now in order to, number one, change jobs. Um, also for those who are laid off, I know quite a few people that are laid off and some of them have been laid off for three months, six months, even, even a year. And this is the tech industry. And so layoffs from post COVID and companies are right sizing and they're really figuring out how many uh, workers do they really need to be more efficient to get that job done. And then you bring AI in, AI has really started scratching the surface yet as far as outplacing tech workers from from a job yet, but I'm sure as LLMs get bigger and AI gets smarter, then we may see some of that as well. But I I do have a question for both of you, and and I do want to encourage people to post. I do see one post out there, a shout out. So we we thank you for that, Stacey. And also post your question. We'd love to, to answer them for you as well. And so for those out there feeling stuck in your current role, what steps can they take in order to enhance their skills and also make themselves more attractive? And I'll let let one of you jump in. Whoever feels more inclined to start off on that one, that would be great. I, I can jump in. I think that you need to look at what you want to do. Having a point to to guide yourself or a direction is so important. Having an opportunity to to move does take self-direction and it can be absolutely challenging when you don't really know which way you want to go. So you need to figure that out first. And and I think that is your guiding light, right? You got to follow through with where you want to go. Now, next step is to look 
at those opportunities, go through the job descriptions, look through who's hiring for those and what it takes, what are on those requirement sheets or what qualifications you don't have versus, you know, what you do. And I would absolutely don't worry about the education stuff. That stuff takes years and years and, and you don't have mm-hmm. years and years. You're looking to, to move quickly, but mm-hmm. are there areas that, Hey, I'm, I'm 75% on all these jobs, but there's this one certification that they're all asking for, or there's this one technology. What can you do to get up to speed so you can understand it? That is my, my goal. You know, if, if I'm telling people to get, get themselves moving in the right direction to, to find a new job, it's always like, what are you missing? and look at the data. The data will be those job descriptions. You can use AI, use AI as an assistant. Don't use AI to do all the work for you because it's going to fail. But you can use it as an assistant, something to bounce thoughts off of. Here are 25 job descriptions. What are the main core things that you see there? And in in two seconds, you'll have a, a small roadmap to review and then obviously make your own edits to it because you don't want to follow it blindly. Mm, okay. Trin, you got anything to add to that? Yeah, I think Ryan hit on something. I think the question that you have to take the time to ask yourself is what do you want, right? And not just what do you want, but like, what really do you want? What do you want and what are you gifted to do and what's going to bring you joy? You can be gift, you can, you can have talent to do something, but that's not your gift, <laughs> right? So okay. there are people that I know that are jumping on the bandwagon to get into tech because they are chasing the bag. I have heard that time and time again, All of a sudden, everybody's like, I want to go into tech. I want to make a lot of money. But I'm talking to folks that I'm coaching and and doing executive coaching with. And what I realize is one of my clients, for instance, he wanted to go into software development, but he he likes people. He doesn't want to sit in cold all day. So I'm like, well, this is not the right thing for you. There may be other things in the field. So I think before we even jump to another job, I think you need to take the time to ask yourself, what do you want? And do an inventory of your skill set and what makes you, what brings you joy? Because I believe that if you align what you are curious about or what you want to do with what you're gifted to do, and you've laid out the type of environment you want to work for, that's the sweet spot. So back to Ryan's point, it it allows you to be laser focused in what types of companies you want to look for, what types of roles you want to look for. So again, as I talked about him, software development was going to be his thing. Product more of a program manager, product manager was the path that he needed to go to go through. But he was looking at the money and the prestige (laughs) of what marketing says, right? Software and software developers are great, but everyone isn't gifted to do that. Right. And he could have probably done a great job, but he wasn't going to be happy. And so I think as people start to look at the next role, you have to make sure that you're not just looking at what you're going to get from a company. You need to understand what do you need to feel fulfilled? What are you going to get other than a paycheck? It's bigger okay. than this. You only get time. You're, you're only, you're only going to have so many hours a day and you're never going to get your time back. So, yeah. so that's what I would just tell people to, because a lot of times what happens, Demetrius and Ryan, is that I see you know how it is. You'll get in, into a company. You're good at what you do. And you're thinking about the next step. And somebody tells you, okay, here's your next step. But you never even realize or take the time to think about, is that really what you want versus what they told you you should have? That, right? That is mm-hmm. absolutely correct. <laughs> I, I think work should absolutely be a challenge and it will have frustrations, but it shouldn't be a chore necessarily. Right. Yeah, and so chasing the dollar, I understand that too. But I do think that if you find yourself in the right position, you can find areas where you can utilize those skills to make the money you're looking to make. And I was, Trina, you mentioned something and I thought about, I remember when I was very early on in my career. So this is like the first 10 years. And now back then it was a while ago when I was, you know, back in my career early off, just getting started. Certifications used to be the number one measurement that in the tech industry we used to to chase after. Mm -hmm. And I'm not so sure that certifications is, it it carries the same weight nowadays or not. And and Ryan, you have a certification, right? Let's say someone with that certification and someone without that certification, how, how much weight does certifications carry? Does that even make a difference in today's market because there's so many talented people out there, people with master's degrees, people with 
15, 20 plus years of experience. So there's a whole lot of different things that people or employers can weigh nowadays. But where does certification sit from your perspective? If I'm hiring and I've got two people with the exact same skill set, carbon copies, one has a certification and one does not, my comfort level and my hiring manager's comfort level, I would assume falls on the certification side. I think certifications are great to get you in front of people. There, it's a good insurance plan for a person hiring to say, hey, this person at least passed you know, this certification and has a skill set, but you have to be able to speak on what you learned. If it's an empty certification, they'll pick that up in a, in a technical mm-hmm. interview. And, and so the certification, well, it, it can be a differentiator. It can be like if in a job market, you're looking for just that one little thing that, that pushes you over the other candidates because there's thousands of candidates in one job. So if you get second place, like it hurts, but it's not a personal thing. It, it, you just need one. You, you just need, that's what I know there's, it's a grind. It's a grind to like, in, like interview to apply and to get mm-hmm. frustrated. Like, and it's, you beat yourself up, but you just need one to say yes. And, you know, getting those second places mean you're getting that close, but like, what can you do on your resume? What can you do in your resume is that, that gives you something that makes you a little bit more marketable than, than say, you know, not having that certification or not knowing that one new technology or, or what have you. Okay. So yeah, certifications are great. They're great listers. Like, you know, you said mine when, they, when you introduced me, you know, it gives you a little bit of credibility behind your name, but it's empty if you can't speak on the stuff that you learned. Okay. I, I love that. And, and Trina, within your coaching business there, are, are you also having conversations around and not just certification? So let, let's say, because me, I think that a, so a high school diploma, right, was way back in the day, like, mm-hmm. got to get that diploma. And then it was like, you know what, you have to get your college degree, mm-hmm. right? And now it's almost like you need a master's degree mm-hmm. in order to just check that box and to be one of those candidates that doesn't get you auto side eyed, which is mm-hmm. what I say, mm-hmm. right? You get that automated note back a week from now or a month from now or six months from now. It's like, hold on, how did I get this auto generated note from this company six months ago? I mean, they need a new algorithm or something, but <laughs> what would you say, Trina? And are you having those conversations around credentials and uh, certifications and, and schooling? I think the right certifications, going back to the previous um, question that you asked around the next move, right? I think the question is, what is that next move and how do you align yourself to be prepared for the next move, right? I, I, what I don't want, and I think Ryan hit on it, is for people to go out and get tons of certifications and they can't speak to it because people know when you're BSing. They like they know they can pick it up when you're not yeah. telling the truth, when you don't have any experience in that area. Anybody can pass a test, but can you do the work? At the end of the day, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. can you bring value to an organization? It gives you a competitive advantage in the sense that it changes the way you think about a thing. So I have my PMP, I have CBCP, I have a bunch of certifications and those certifications help me have a different perspective than the one that I was living inside of a company. So I am for my clients definitely getting certified. But what I share with them is that you can't just lean on certification. And to your point, Demetrius, you can't just lean on your your undergraduate degree or your master's degree anymore. I think Mm -hmm. the thing that gives you a competitive advantage is number one, your brand and number two, your network. Okay. Right. Because you can have certifications all day long, but if nobody knows you, it does not matter. If no one trusts you, if no one is looking for you or know that you exist and know the value that you bring to organizations, it's hard for them to find you. It's hard for Ryan to find you. Right. So, so your branding and your branding is not just LinkedIn. Your branding is you're building your brand every single thing, every single day and what you do at your job in your community everywhere. We are all building our brands every single day. So that's, that's number one. And then number two is a network because here's what we know. If you pick up the phone and call me and I have a job and I'm, I have, I have, I have this position and you have the skill set that I'm looking for. Even mm-hmm. if you do not have that certification and Ryan has that certification, who do you think is going to get the job? Right? You're a person, right? Yeah. You're the one who it's you It's going to be the person I trust. Cause I don't know Ryan. Like I don't know him, right? I know, I know you. You do now, right? you know. But I now. do now, right? It's different now. But but what I'm saying is that you know the certifications to me are, are table stakes. The education part is table stakes. 
it might not be an MBA. It might not be an undergraduate degree. It could be a two-year, you know, two-year program at a trade school. The reality is we know that even if you get all of that, you can do all the right things. If you don't have the right network and your brand is, does not exist, it's going to mm-hmm. be harder for you to compete with people that have a strong network and have a have a solid brand in the marketplace. That's like, just reality. Uh, yeah, I'd like to add on on that network piece. Yeah. I think having a strong network is is yes, hundred hundred percent on what you're saying. You you go at networks rely on each other, especially you know as careers progress. But does your network know what you do? Exactly. And that's a big thing. You know, I got a huge network. Not everybody can speak on my accomplishments. Probably most of them can't. So if you're looking for a job and you're using networks or asking for referrals, you know, spend time with the people that you're asking. Make sure they know what to highlight, what you've done, because there is definitely a referral that comes to my desk. It's like, hey, this person's my friend's, you know, wife, great person. And then there's us. There's ones that come in like, hey, I think this person could be really strong. This is, you know, an associate of mine. They've done this, this, this and this. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that the friend's wife, you know, I'm not as excited about when we find out, hey, it's just a, it's just a friend, great person. When I yeah, know a little yeah. bit more going in about that person and what they've accomplished and what they do, especially related to what my opening is, make sure you're, you're not just giving one elevator pitch and that's it, like tailor it to, to highlight why you're fit for the role when you're talking to your network, but you have to educate your network on who you are. You can't just rely on them understanding you. You can't just give them your resume, like talk to them, make sure they know why you think this is a good fit and, yeah. and you'll get a better push more, more times than not. Yeah. I, I love the whole network piece. And I, I tell computer science students because I sit on the board of the computer science department at Tennessee state university. And they always ask me, well, how do, how do you get that next job? And so I say it all starts with, and, and Trina, you mentioned this earlier, it was about branding. And so mm-hmm. you don't brand just by jumping on a camera, right? Or posting on the internet. I mean, you really have to sit down and think about the end goal. Okay, how do I wanna look? maybe find someone else who already has that that brand thing figured out. And then you put pen to paper and you start really mapping out, you know, how do you want to look? And then what certifications do you need? I mean, it's, it's a meticulous plan as far as branding is concerned. And do I want to create that YouTube channel? Do I want to create that podcast? I mean, really sit down and, and write and map it out. But I do appreciate all the comments as well. I see one as well, auto-generated emails happen all the time. Let's see, months later happens all too often. And also Gabriel, long time listener. Thank you for listening. First time live. Trina and Ryan, what what are some practical steps that tech workers can take today in order to future proof? And I don't even know if that's a thing. Is, Is there such thing as future proofing your career like I, I hope I hope you can tell me <laughs> Trina because I don't I don't have a an answer for proof future proof I'm looking at today and looking at tomorrow right now so um, <laughs> okay. I don't know I, I do want to yeah as far as I, I would embrace change because that's the only constant so you know AI has been in the news it's been everywhere it's not able to do people's jobs at this point in time but the people who adopt it and know how to utilize it the best are going to be, you know, get a head start than the people who are avoiding it right now because they just don't want to learn something new. So uh, and embracing change is just and having a creative mindset on your own career and critical, you know, mindset on on where you can go and where you can make a difference. Staying ahead of the curve is, is the best way to, to do that. But you can't I, I don't think you can future proof anything. But I did want to kind of go through, I, I saw that the auto generated email stuff. I know how frustrating that is, but I do, I'd love to put some education on that as well, because rejections can be hard and it, it really feels bad when it's just a computer that's doing it. A lot of companies, they don't have AI. And that's what I read all the time. AI just, you know, rejected me. It's, it can be a lot of different things. It can be timing. It can be like, they got flooded with applicants and they got, 10 great people with the first 100 that came in and then they just don't have time to interview everybody for the role. It could Mm -hmm. be that the role opened up and 
you know, they're looking at applicants and all of a sudden somebody internally said, hey, raise their hand, I'd like that job. And now they're interviewing the internal person first. It, there's so many different variables that are in play when you when you're applying for jobs. You cannot take the rejections personally because there's stuff that you don't know that's going on in the back end. I think it does take too long for companies sometimes to give you a notification on what's going on. But if they haven't talked to you and you get a automated rejection, likely it's the the, the role closed, right? And mm -hmm. they didn't okay. get to you, they didn't get to you yet, or that they had um, different scenarios. If you applied right away. Um, they have something very specific. You're going to see mm -hmm. a lot more of this right now because there's just so many more options for employers. They can be a little bit more picky on who they're bringing in. Um, but I would, I just want to say like, I agree. Auto-generated stuff doesn't feel great. And sometimes it's not hearing back from an application is a little bit better because you out of sight, out of mind. But it, it, if you're taking these rejections personally, like try not to, because it is a numbers game in, in that respect. And you've got to keep your, your own health uh, in mind and, and to move forward. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, and Trina, I, I was going to let you answer that, but I have a different one for you. Okay. So as Ryan was speaking, something jumped in my mind about just like, sometimes, you know, I would get all in my head about an interview is, I guess, what tips can you give to someone out there right now that may be on this live stream or may see it later? maybe some pre tips around how do they prepare mm -hmm. for that interview? And then once they prepare, how do they appear as a strong candidate during that interview? Yeah. So number one, I'm going to tell you, and, and I learned this in undergrad research, the company, like, and I, and look, you have like, you know, Ryan said, you can leverage a chat GPT or Gemini or whatever, but Take the time to get to under to, to know the company, understand at least what are their top three goals. You know, I always look at their stock the week before I go in and and, and interview because it's something okay. that most people don't pay attention to, right? Is you can always comment on that because that's also a connection point. But I think number one, you need to do your homework. You've got to understand the company, understand what what they're what they're what they're focused on. And, and again, you can leverage the financial statements as well. Leverage LinkedIn. So, you know, I would look at my network, see who works there, call them up, see if I can get some time with people and get a sense of the culture, get mm -hmm. a sense of the things that they may not talk about in the street. Right. Okay. And understand what's going on, because there could be some big projects that you want to you want to connect to. So I would do that due diligence. And then I think it goes, you know, the last thing I would say is make sure you're showing up the way that you want them to see you. And let me tell you what I mean by that. So if you're going to go and interview for a bank, you cannot show up in khakis and a button down. You probably gonna need a suit, right? Yeah. Even if it's on camera, I don't care if you have jogging pants under, you need to show up with the suit on. If it's a woman, probably a nice dress or, you know, collar, you know, a very nice blazer with a collar shirt. You have to show up to the place that, that you have to look like the people you're trying to work for. Right. Okay. And I always yeah. say up it up. So even at a, as a Google, Google is a little bit more lax with their attire, which is fine because it's their culture. I still would show up with a nice blazer, a button down shirt. You have to set yourself apart. And it's easy right now because we're all, you know, a lot of us are still at home. Some people are still going back to the office, but we got kind of lazy during COVID. Like, I don't know about you guys, but like sweatpants <laughs> and jeans were kind of the norm. And the reality is culturally and generationally, a lot of the people that people are going to interview with are typically going to be Xers and probably some baby boomers. You might get some millennials, but they're still old school. Very much. You need to show up to the job you want, not the job we're giving you. Right. And you only mm -hmm. get one chance to make a first impression. And then I know people are going to probably ask the other thing they're going to say is, well, Trina, what if I don't have the money? We all can go find leverage resources that we have in our communities. They have places that offer dresses and coats and things. And I, I mean, when I was in college, I had kids that would go to Goodwill and they would buy a nice shirt and they would press it and yeah. they would show up with a nice tie on and throw on something, you know, even if it's a shawl for a woman. Right. Like, but you need to show up like you want the job and you look like what they need. Because, again, it goes back to marketing. This is a part of the package. I can love you on, on, on paper, 
paper is is this what gets you in the door that's the ticket to get you in to see ryan but how you show up and how you sell yourself and convince him of the value that you're going to help drive in that company that starts with when you show up and how you the first the, his first impression of you so you yeah, got to gotta do the work and you got to show up and you got to look yeah. the part yeah and if you're online you don't want your background to be just a distraction. You don't want people thinking about the Chicago Bears when they're talking to you. You want them to think about you. So make you sure take you your hats down, Ryan. Yeah, make sure your background <laughs> isn't distracting. We had there's an interview that happened a while back when COVID first started, and you know the person's laundry basket was right behind them, and and that wasn't was was not a good. That was everything that everyone was talking about. Another one. It was, you know, just the, you know, how they didn't make their bed, right? Like, you, yeah, we all we can't control what what's behind us all the time, but we can for a camera, right? So, do your best there. My advice on the the question, Trina said everything that I would agree with. I think interviewing is tough. It it puts you on the spot. Some people are good on the spot. Some people aren't. But the the one thing, and it'll be more tactful. What what I'm saying is that you want to limit the amount of time you need to talk on the spot. And, and the only way you can do that is, all right, so predict, like what could be asked. And usually there's going to be like, tell me about a time where there's a challenge, like tell me about something. And you want to be able to talk through examples, not can you do something? Yes, I can do something. That doesn't, that means nothing. Can you do something? Yes, as a matter of fact, and, and come up with a couple different stories that hit multiple points and go on your resume, review them, think about them, think about how you did them, how you interacted, what the outcomes were, what you learned ahead of time, and then practice talking about it. Look in the mirror, just talk through the story. Uh, Because I I can tell you, if you are answering a question on the spot, maybe twice, and the rest of them are like, oh yeah, let me, yes, I do. And I have an example that that's right, right? And you pull it out of your back pocket, you're just able able to talk immediately on it. That's impressive. And yeah. it, it's a little, it takes an hour or two of preparation. It's, it's your true experience. Utilize it. Just make sure you're, you know what's on your resume, you know those stories, and you, you have them ready to share. I, I love this. And I appreciate all the comments as well in the, in the chat box here. More questions. I mean, we would love to spend a few more minutes here with you. Number one, giving you some key insights into what, what we're seeing right now. And maybe not what I'm seeing, but what these experts are seeing. We have Trina here who is really, she's running her own consulting and coaching business as well. And so we have Ryan here with all of his experience, senior director for people. So he knows the industry. I mean, he probably sits behind the keyboard and he may hit that button to give you that, that auto rejection letter, but I'm sure Ryan wouldn't do it unless he had to do it. I don't like doing it. (laughs) It's not something I enjoy for sure. It's worth part of that. Yeah. But no, so there's also some talk as well, you know, when I turn on MSNBC and CNBC, there's a lot of talk about recession right now and job numbers are being analyzed 4.1%, 4.3% as far as uh, what, what those um, numbers are. And then we're talking, you know, the housing market and interest rates are going up. We have this election that's approaching. I mean, there's so many different economic indicators and I mean the the world at hand and also what's going on in Israel and Ukraine and Russia. I mean, there's so much right now. And then you have to worry about your, your job, right? Like, am I going to get laid off or am I stuck in my current position right now? What's one thing, and and this is not really about the, the job market, but in Trina, I know you're very spiritual person here. Maybe, maybe a tip around someone who's a little stressed out right now, feeling stuck, and they just need a breather from trying to find that next job. Yeah, so I, number one, that you said breather. Number one, you do need to breathe. What I, what I, you know, when I'm work, working with my clients, whether it's business consulting or even executive coaching, the reality is we walk around holding our breaths and, and, and grinding our teeth, clenching our jaw all day because of the stress and the anxiety that, a number of us deal with. And it does not matter what level of organization mm-hmm. you're in. You could be the lowest level up into the, the top levels of an organization. With me being in, in corporate for over 25 years, I have seen it firsthand that people yeah. are still people regardless of their job descriptions. So number one, you know, when you feel that stress or that thing, because everybody's thing is a little different, just take a minute and just take 10 deep breaths in and out. Cause you can do that anywhere. 
right? Just, just breathe. Yeah. And that will settle you and reset you and recenter you. So that's number one for me. Um, you know, Demetrius, you, you know, I am a, I am a Jesus Christ follower. I pray everything that I do is, is in alignment with my faith. And so for me, the question is, okay, God, what are you trying to teach me in this experience? What is it you want me to learn? What, what do I need to surrender? Where do I truly need to put my, my faith instead of, the job because what happens is this is just something that I've always said. We think that our jobs or our is 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 our source. It's not. It is a job. Mm. It is an exchange for money and time. It is not your life. I promise you. Right? Yeah. Right. And so the reality is God is my source. The job is a resource. And even when someone says they've given me a I job, I know they didn't give me the job. They were just the vessel that God used to give me that job. Just like they're the vessel that God may use to hit the rejection button or to say, you know what, we need to separate and to, 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 to the point around just understanding your purpose. We are working in these jobs in order to learn something. And when the assignment is complete, it is okay. It does not mean that you're a bad person because you got laid off or because they eliminate a role. It just means yeah. that that time, that season is up. And so I think what we've got to do, again, your life is so much bigger than your job. And once you change your lens and your perspective around that, it makes it a lot easier for you to navigate the ebbs and the flows of life because life is always changing. There, there is no day that is consistent. Today, you may be well. Tomorrow, you could be sick. Today, you may have a job. Tomorrow, you may not. You have to prepare. So I would tell you, always have some savings. You need to have some savings. Leverage your network. And always think about what is this experience trying to teach me? Life is always trying to teach us something. The mm. question is, will you learn the lesson so that you don't have to repeat it when you go to the next job or the next thing? So I know that was a lot, but but to me, you know, I guess the key things is breathe. And, and you don't have to believe what I believe in. I have tons of people that I love and pray over and talk to that don't believe what I believe. But your faith is your foundation because that should be the thing yeah. that does not shake regardless of what's going on in the world, that should be your foundation because it, it is consistent. Regardless of which religion you practice, does not matter. I've studied many. The consistency is the consistency, which is your foundation. And that's what you need to keep you steady during those times that are, that are, that are going to be rocky. And then the last thing I just want to remember, a job is a job. It is not your life. It is an exchange of time for money. And when okay. that, that time is up, it does not necessarily mean you're a bad person. And it does not necessarily mean that that's a bad company or a bad boss. The assignment is complete and you move on to the next thing and embrace it and be happy that you had the experience that you had so that you could move on to the next thing. I love on. that. Yeah, I, I, I love that. Tina. And <laughs> definitely uh, love that. Love that perspective. Amen. So <laughs> uh, we, we do have a question that came in from from Brianna. Thank you for for that question. What advice? can you give to a young adult who are in their first job and also trying to advance in their career? And Ryan, why don't you, why don't you take that one for us? Yeah, I think you got to take it as much as you can in certain aspects, as long as you see it as an opportunity, leverage frustrations and, and kind of rewrite the narrative when work comes your way that might not be on the job description. I think it's great to take it on and learn from it and find out, you know, yes, give yourself a moment to be frustrated. Like I'm doing two people's jobs. That's so frustrating. Mm -hmm. However, then take the breaths that uh, Trina told us about, because I do the same thing, <laughs> you know, when I need to, or I go for a walk, mm -hmm. when I need to reset, control what you can control. And one thing you can do is like, look at the other, uh, other side of it. Yes. Today's going to be a hard day. Yes. I'm going to have to readjust my priorities and get multiple things done, but what can doing this give me? Mm -hmm. And then like use it as a source of opportunity instead of a, a source of frustration. I think that's a big thing that, you know, people can do. And, and that's, I've used that my entire career and it's helped me. I, I I've gotten jobs. I've gotten promotions because I've taken on work that wasn't mine. And I don't, you know, and I, I said, I go, that's an opportunity. I never said no to something that I felt like I, I could, I could tackle. I think not waiting for your boss to advance your career, you drive, you drive because yeah. young, you know, young adults, young professionals, 
and old professionals, I see the same thing. Like, when's the company going to promote me? When, when, when's this going to happen? Mm-hmm. Like, they don't tell me what I'm going to do next. Well, that's not their job. Their job is to make money for the organization mm-hmm. and to help operations work. Your job is to do what, do what you can to fulfill the requirements of the role and take care of yourself because a corporation doesn't have feelings. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, so, so what you need to do is guide yourself. Just like I said in the, the job search, it's the same thing for working professionals. Know where you want to go. And if you don't know, like try it, try your best to, to at least make a small goal for yourself. Put mm-hmm. something in front of you. Like I need to learn how to do this. I know look at the people that are doing what you want to do successfully and, and, talk to them, read about them, you know, ask questions and model some of the things that they've done or learned to, to guide you. If you don't have your own direction, like there are ways to find it. I have to have long-term goals, but I I would never get to a long-term goal without hitting all the little milestone goals that I put in front of myself, because that's how I feel good. Because a long-term goal, you won't feel good on the, on the course. It's going to be like this, it's going to be like this, it's going to be like that. And, and then you'll, you'll plummet at times. I'm really hard to get out of the weeds in, that, in those long paths. So find your wins. What, what win can I get today? What win can I get in a week? What win can I get in a month? And chase those, but make sure those are all charting in the same direction of where you want to go. Wow. Okay. This is this has been some great advice. Maybe time for for one more question as well. I don't see anything except a great comment. Thank thank you again, Stacy. Great advice all around. Be the driver of your career in life. Uh, also, I, I had a question around: it is is now the time to? Let's say you've been in that job. You you are a, a young adult, as Brianna mentioned. And maybe you only been in that job for two years, three years, right? And so you're you're still making what you made when when they hired you on two or three years ago. And we all know that in order to buy a house right now, you have to be making somewhere around what ninety ninety plus thousand dollars single individual. That that's a lot of money, and and that's based on where we're sitting right now with inflation and just kind of overall how things have headed but it is now the right time to ask for a raise i mean can can you ask for a raise should you ask for that raise or should you just just sit tight and just shh, do put your head down and do your work i'll sh- i'll share my my perspective and then i'll okay. turn it over to my my friend here look i I believe that a closed mouth does not get fed. That's just what I believe. I believe that 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 relates not only to the increase, but also I think the the question that Brianna had around career projection. I think you have to tell people that you want to grow in an organization. And with growth, we know money comes. But I think the key piece is who you tell, right? Mm -hmm. So you need some sponsors. You need some mentors. You need some coaches that can help you navigate the systems of organizations. Because what Ryan understands, and I understand, especially being an executive that has staff, is that there are side conversations always being had. There are budget conversations always being had. There's there's conversations that are being had around talent at least once or twice a year. And sometimes off, off cycle where I can influence roles. But I think you need to understand the rules of engagement in an organization so then you can decide, OK, is this the right time? So, for instance, if Brianica was working in my organization, she's been working with me for two years. She's taken on some additional responsibility, as you know, Ryan mentioned. She's now doing two jobs and she's been doing it for six months and she's knocking it out the park. I expect for her to come to me and say, hey, Trina, let's have a conversation. Here's the value. Can't be a feeling conversation. This is business. As Ryan said, corporations okay. don't have feelings. Here's the value I've been able to drive for the organization. Here are the things that I've been able to do. Here are the customer, you know, comments, blah, blah, blah. What opportunities do I have to continue to, in, to increase my income and grow in the organization? That's a different conversation than me saying I need a raise, right? Yeah. How could she have had that conversation? The reason she had the conversation with me like that is because she either had a conversation with a mentor that could give her the language to coach her on how to have a business discussion around her value and her money or a sponsor, 
right? To help her navigate. Or they may have said, this is not the right time. You can't have a conversation right now. Wait another month because we're going to do talent reviews during that time. So the key piece that a lot of times we forget, you can ask for what you want. But before you ask, understand the rules of engagement, which a lot of times we don't, right? What are the mm -hmm. rules? And how do you get those rules? You need mentors. You need sponsors to help you navigate the systems. Because again, Ryan, me as an executive, it's a lot of stuff that I got. I get, I get to see that you don't get to see. I get to see the system. And Ryan definitely gets to see how the machine works from an HR perspective, because he's going to mm -hmm. touch every, every aspect of the organization. When you understand the rules of engagement, you leverage them to your benefit. And then you always talk about value because it's got to be a value discussion. And then what you brought to the table and then what you expect to be fairly compensated for. But never ask for a raise. Talk about your value. Develop the right relationship so they can help you navigate the conversation at the right time and with the right people. I love it. Ryan, you, you, you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I could talk forever. I think, you know, like, like you said something very important and it was something that I wrote down to say because it was a, it was in a seminar, they said it and I never forgot it. But the most important conversations that happen about your career happen outside of a room that are in a room that you're not in. Right. So, mm. you know, that's, that's something that I have kind of kept in mind is that, you know, like people are going to talk about you. That's the fact. They're going to talk about your performance. They're going to talk about the future. They're going to talk about giving you that raise potentially or not. Sometimes your direct manager has no control over it. Sometimes their manager has no control over it. Sometimes it's the, the economics of, of the business or the budget or, you know, sales are dropping or if somebody else in, you know, in the organization just got, you know, that, that funding, like just because you deserve the raise doesn't necessarily mean they can give it to you. And so, yes, I think proving your value and sharing your value and sometimes asking for that raise is appropriate and it's and it's needed to, so that it's at least on the radar, but I wouldn't expect a, a immediate results. I think getting the opportunities that we talked about earlier, like embracing them, taking them on and learning and growing and taking what you can, if they're not going to give you that raise, you you can come out of that position if, if it's a layoff or if it's your own free will with more skills than when you came in then go go after the the more appropriate compensation somewhere else i mean there's nothing wrong with with that i i do think that timing is is always a thing it's a real thing economics you know yeah. and, and where things are at is it's a real thing so what what somebody is making last year versus what you can get right now can be different just like buying a house it can be you know the same house can be priced differently at different times you have to be realistic on what you're going for one thing that i i had to kind of learn over the years is that there are different compensation structures there are different pluses and benefits to different roles and just because somebody is in a similar job making more money than you doesn't mean that that your job is exactly the same so you, if you want a a role and you know you hit the job market and it's not paying what you want that just might be the facts and if you are stuck on on that as your only driver you can get yourself in a situation where you're on the job market for a year year and a half because you haven't it, it's hard to kind of come to terms and and my goal if i'm moving jobs is like i just don't want to think about turning hulu off that's that's my priority. It's like what do I don't want to think about those bills. I want to live the lifestyle I'm living, but am I going to apply for jobs three times higher than role or three three levels above what I'm at in a company that's twice the size? No, I, I mean that's that, that that's a pipe dream. So I'm going to be a little bit more realistic with my search. I'm going to look at what what companies are going through what I just went through. You know, like that I can bring extra value to, not just the skills, but like let's look at like matches of the companies like the industries i was in this industry it's gonna be a lot easier to go to a com like a competitor or a similar industry where the skills are more transferable if i want remote find a remote job but find one that's close by to where you live i guarantee you they'll give you the edge just because they're remote doesn't mean they don't want to get together easily so like be strategic about how you're looking you know and i'm probably going off the point here at this point but I do think that's very important and it's helpful. It's like, it's a numbers game. You want to apply to, you know, as much as you can, but also be smart on how you're doing it and what you're targeting. And if, 
if the compensation doesn't match up correctly, like what's your lifestyle? What do you need to make to, to get the lifestyle you want? And how are you going to you know target to get there is, is the plan you want to put into place? Not necessarily just like earlier, Trina said, like going after a job because it pays a lot of money. Okay. So you, yeah. That's, that's a lot harder. Yeah. I appreciate that. And looks like Brianna had a comment slash question here. A lot of young professionals have this conversation once they graduate um, with their bachelor's and, and then their master's um, degree, but they can never find a job to hire them because they always say that they have no skills because mm -hmm. they still only have a few years of experience. So what advice can you give them so they won't lose hope finding a job? Yeah, that that's that's a lot, right? <laughs> and I know we only have a few minutes here, but uh, maybe maybe. 30 seconds, Trina, and 30 yeah. seconds, Ryan, just a quick one point, and then we'll begin to close out. 30 seconds. Okay. I'm going to say network, 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 and then just get a job somewhere. One of the things, and, and I'm just say quickly, one of the things that I find with my Zs and my millennials, and I love them dearly because they keep me on my toes, they feel like once they've gotten, they've graduated, it's just somebody's going to automatically give you a certain level of a role. Sometimes you may go work at a company that's paying you way less money than your value, but you're in the company, which then gives you an opportunity to influence someone to give you maybe a professional job because you're in, you have your foot in the door. That's what we used to call it. Get your foot in the door. Mm -hmm. Leverage getting your foot in the door and don't despise small beginnings because you don't know what those small beginnings are going to take you. Right. But I, I do think take what you can get because you got to eat and then keep networking. And then the third, the last thing I would tell you is explore entrepreneurship like we you don't have to go work for a company you could start a franchise you know you may have parents that may be willing to give you seed money or you could do some consulting on the side a number of you are marketing gurus you know how to do different things that most people don't want to do or they're not interested in doing sell your service that's another path of income it doesn't mean that you have to go work in corporate america there are other paths you can go work in government you can go work for some small startups you got to you've got to you've got to diversify where you're looking and keep your options open, whether it be corporate or whether you do something on the side just to make your ends meet. That would be my recommendation. Great advice there, Ryan. I, I agree wholeheartedly. I think you need to get in front of as many um, people as possible. So if it's volunteering, if you have the time, like you need to network. And the only way you can network is to get in front of as many people as you possibly can. Uh, Liz just said uh, internships. That was the next point. Yeah, take on an internship. Uh, I can tell you that entry-level candidates that have internships get noticed over ones that have, you know, nothing or jobs and not career jobs or experience on their resumes. And then the last thing that I would absolutely say is please don't give up. It only takes one. That's, I mean, that it only takes one. So every interview, if and if it, you bombed it or you thought it was great, it's the interview experience, even if they don't give you the, the feedback, you're going to get more comfortable talking. Use it as experience. Don't give up. Keep pushing. It is a numbers game. And right now, the odds may be against you, but once you start building that experience, getting in front of more people, you just need one person to give you that shot and you'll get there. You'll get a shot. All right. And Elizabeth, thank you for your comment as well that Internships are a great bridge, and she also completely agrees with you, Trina. Get started somewhere and bet on yourself to gain the skills to to move forward toward your goal. And then we also have Stacy, who gets the MVP of, of posting. <laughs> uh, she said, "That's good, Trina. Don't don't minimize small beginnings." And I, I do appreciate this. And this is a a, a live stream that I, I really really, really felt strongly about setting up because, you know, I've been grappling with just the whole uncertainty around the market as well. And just really trying to have these conversations at home, you know, with, with my kids and also making sure that, that they understand how to navigate this job market as well. So I really do appreciate all the expert advice, all the insight, and all of the experience, especially you, Ryan, you've been in the in the HR industry for quite some time. So your perspective w was a great perspective. And Trina, yours as well. And so a final shout out or anything else that you like to say before we end here? 
Yeah. Well, on so first of all, again, thank you for for having having me. The one thing I'll just say is that we are all created to do something amazing for the world. It may take time to find that amazing, but getting to the amazing is the good and the bad. That's a part of the process. So don't despise the process. It's a part of it. If you are interested in executive coaching or need business consulting, you can reach out to me. I am the CEO of TLH Consulting Enterprises, but you can DM me on LinkedIn. That's probably the quickest and easiest way to connect with me. I am Trina L. Hill on LinkedIn with a lot of letters behind my name. I'm, I'm the only one. And I do look forward to hearing from each of you and also just continue to pray for your success. So thank you. All right, Ryan. Yeah, I, I just want to say thank you for, for having me today and listening to what I have to say. If anybody has any need for my advice or want to reach out and hear a little bit more about my opinions on things, because they are subjective, they are opinions, I'd be happy to share, be happy to help any way that I can. Just shoot me a message on LinkedIn. Otherwise, you know, it's a pleasure being here and thank you. All right. We are at the end here. Thank you all so much. I appreciate everyone attending as well. And uh, also, please be sure to check out Data Protection Gumbo podcast as well. And that can be found at dataprotectiongumbo.com. And then we also have a YouTube channel. And so I, I hope that everyone takes some nuggets of information away in order to take that next step or just breathe. So thank you, everyone. And we'll see you on the other side.